My guest today in over a beer at Café Luxembourg is United States Ambassador to the European Union, Anthony Gardner. We talk about the transatlantic relationship, the future of Europe and the roots of rage. Ambassador Gardner, thank you for joining us today. TTIP seemed as though it should be a straightforward sell when you started uh, your post. Were you surprised by the pushback, by the reaction? I learned a tremendous amount. And one of the obvious lessons I learned early on is that trade is a proxy issue. It's not about trade. It certainly wasn't about TTIP, right, in large part. It was about something much, much, much bigger. It was about globalization. It was about fear. People are living in fear of their world being, again, shaken and rattled after eight years of financial crisis. Uh, and they felt that the last thing that they wanted, many member states, is to have another big revolutionary project that would somehow would be change their world, lower their standards, threaten their way of life. And we can, uh, we can reject uh, some of the uh, extremism, some of the populism on both sides of the Atlantic, some of the, the language that's been used. Uh, but what we really shouldn't do, uh, either political or business at least, what we shouldn't do is reject the core fears are being expressed because let's face it some of those fears are legitimate many many people do feel that uh, the world the system is rigged uh, the elites are not listening to them the elites are not delivering on what they want I think those are all legitimate fears why do you think people express this set of fears primarily through some form of racism some sort of xenophobia do you think that's correct well, s some of it may have been that, but I think it's much, much broader than xenophobia or, uh, or racism. I think uh, people feel that for the first time, the life of their children is not going to be as good uh, as their own lives. And that is a fundamental change that we've seen over the last decades. You know, books and many, many articles have been written about this, but what are the roots of rage, as I call them? What, what's behind all of this? And there are many, many explanations, but one of them uh, that resonated with me after reading it is a study of 25 developed economies and what's happened to the middle class in those 25 developed economies. Across all the 25, including many European countries, you, see, you saw middle class that's very fearful. Uh, fearful and skeptical of not only their national governments but particularly of Brussels and that's a skepticism which has been fueled uh, by member state governments who would often like to play the blame game. You grew up uh, for part of your time in Italy, your father served as ambassador under uh, Jimmy Carter's administration then too and it was a time of revolutionary politics as well. People today seem to think that this is something new, that this, this uh, rage is something new, but your experience in Italy then, that must have shocked you. Yes, you're right. This is not the first time we're going through this. I, I lived for several years in Rome during a very, very fraught, difficult time uh, when the center seemed to be imploding. Uh, and when you walked around the streets of Rome, you'd see uh, the walls of uh, houses covered in manifestos of the Communist Party and the Fascist Parties, or the Monarchist Parties. The things that you, we often easily forget about today, monarchist parties in Italy. Communist Party was at nearly, I think, 35%, if I'm not mistaken, and was perched on uh, becoming uh, either in government or actually leading in government. So we do forget that. And it's an important message because being in the middle being a centrist, being a moderate has never been easy, but today it is again very, very hard. I feel the, the center is being squeezed and, in, and is in danger of being squeezed out of existence. There's a line that President Obama likes to use, which I love. It's from a, a, a Yeats poem. The best lack all conviction, the worst are full of passionate intensity. And it's very true. Moderates have to speak out. If they don't speak out to defend these basic principles of democracy, free trade, and so forth, then, uh, then we, are, we are at risk of losing many things we took for granted. In Italy, you were there at the time that Aldo Moro was kidnapped and killed. Yeah. For that to happen today would be uh, something extremely shocking for the whole of Europe. What changed after that time? Why did Italy find more stability? Why did this uh, season of revolution and rage pass at that moment? That's a good question. You know, I think Italy um, showed incredible maturity as a democracy to respond to those terrorist attacks, the killing of Aldo Moro. I was at school then, I remember it very, very well. They responded to it not by overreaction, but by living by its principles. Free and fair trials, 
human rights were respected, it would have been very, very easy to say we're going to do away, do away with habeas corpus, we're going to have, let's say, military tribunals and so forth. They did not. They took their time, they responded, and that, that surge passed. And I think that's probably a good lesson for us today. We have to stand up for the values that we believe in. Uh, and in many ways, many examples of that, both, both inside Europe where those principles are being questioned even by some member states and also on the frontiers of Europe, let's say in Ukraine. If, if Europe and the United States do not stand up for the key values of territorial integrity in the 21st century and supporting those who want to become members who are you know, free market prosperous democracies and members of the European family in the case of Ukraine, then I really do fear for the future. Why do you think that those who would today be called uh, the elites or even liberal elites are so quiet? It's hard to do battle with people who are willing to say anything and to do anything. Partly because it's a good business model. And I lived through this during TTIP, I can tell you. I really sense this. A lot of it was manufactured fear and manufactured hatred. Now, if you believe in facts, if you believe in trying to do your best to present a case that's based in fact, it's much harder because it doesn't sell as well. Being moderate is often boring. Uh, and it's a very different business model. Um, so we are fighting this battle with one arm tied behind our back, so to speak. At the same time, we see the manufactured hatred being financed and supported. Uh, I'll say it openly, by Russia and by others, uh, but also the NGOs, uh, you know, this will be slightly provocative, but it happens to be true. Uh, some NGOs have realized that being against something, particularly being against TTIP, is a great money-making proposition because you look at the figures and you see that their fundraising skyrocketed when TTIP came along. Many have been quoted as saying TTIP was the best thing that ever happened to us because we can finally get people on the streets and giving us money. Never mind about whether the fears had anything to do with what we were negotiating. We need to find a better way of articulating. What you describe our sounds like position. an election campaign. It doesn't sound like a policy process. Yes, so this is a campaign. So, is this a time where European politics, European institutions, need to fight a constant political election campaign on the issues and not have a debating chamber amongst those who are participating in that process? Well, yeah, that's a great question. You know, I said from very early on in TTIP, my view was this is not a trade negotiation or just a trade negotiation. This is a campaign. Let's treat this as a campaign. Let's have a war room, basically, right? Where we have professional media consultants, where we have groups of people where we test certain messages. Uh, and we, you know, I think one of the messages that I'm going to draw after I leave my job is that uh, for a trade negotiation of this type, which touches not just on tariffs, but touches on regulatory cooperation, things that touch people's lives, the food they eat, the way they live, we should have understood this is much more than just about trade. It is a campaign, and that changes the entire way you talk about it. STRATCOM is part of the answer, the strategic communications unit that's been set up uh, by it's still the, tiny. Well, I was going to say, so we're, what are there, eight people with a small budget? Not a criticism of what they're doing. I happen to think that their work product is actually really good, uh, very timely. Um, but it's small. I mean, we're, 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 the budget for... It's a million versus a billion. Exactly. More or less. You're right. A million versus a billion. Uh, it's not only Russia Today, it's in multiple languages, it's radio, and it's the trolls that are spewing out all sorts of misinformation with the knowledge that even if 90% of the mud doesn't stick, 10% does. So I would like to see a massive increase in financing for countering Russian propaganda. Uh, I would love to see the next administration do precisely that. Could you see yourself play a role in that after you leave office here? I'd love to. I think it's really a huge challenge. Uh, I think we're much too timid. You referred to it. You know, moderates are by nature too timid. We need to make the case more strong. We need to show in a much more effective way financing that's happening the national level and the European level. We know it's there of political parties and of NGOs. But we've been dancing around the issue a bit too much. Let's put out the information. Your time here, what, what will be the memorable moments? What has struck you most, positively and negatively? So the short answer is, I have seen the power of this relationship when we are aligned. And I just hope we will continue to be aligned. I am leaving with some concerns 
about um, the durability of that agenda, and my message is that the European project is not just good for Europeans, it's also served U.S. interests. Because who are we going to call when we need allies to address all of these issues, long list of issues, instability in the Middle East or in the, in, in the neighboring regions to Europe, uh, or migration, or Iran, you know, the list goes on. It can't just be individual uh, member states of the EU, it has to be also the EU institutions. Your advice for your successor, what would you tell them? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's very, that's a tough question. No, be, uh, believe in the job. It's a great job, best job I'll ever have. Um, something that I hope he believes in, and uh, that the, the, this relationship is an important one. Very well. Our team put together uh, some questions. So if you choose five of these, I'll ask oh. you in quick succession. All right. One, two, three, four, five. How about these? Very well. Let's see what you got. Thank you. <laughs> Which profession other than your own would you like to attempt? I would love to be a writer. Of what? Of fiction. But I'm not capable of doing it. You work for the commission. <laughs> <laughs> Spokesperson. <laughs> What's the best piece of advice you've ever received? Well, I was lucky to get a lot of good advice from my, uh, from my father, but I think uh, the one I'm, I'm remembering right now, I know it's a bit banal, but it's very, very true. Things are never as good as they seem, and they're never as bad as they seem. Uh, very, very important to remember that. Um, that there is, there's always change possible, and you have to believe in what you're doing. And maybe related to that, maybe related to that, and it's something I've only learned recently, passion is very important. I grew up in a family of lawyers, and I went to law school, and I always believed in facts, and I was kind of driven by facts. It only gets you so far. If you only believe in facts, and you, you're not passionate about what you do, it's very, very hard to have an intense professional life and to get through those moments of real, you know, disappointment. What's your guilty pleasure of food, activity, song, TV show? Oh, well, I don't know if it's that guilty, but I love watching, uh, I love watching TV series on my iPad at night and, and traveling. It's not that guilty, but uh, I guess my guilty pleasure is I love very good hotels. Okay. Maybe that's a really, that's a <laughs> sinful pleasure. At least a lot to confess to that. Which book is currently on your bedside table? I'm guessing there's more than one, actually. If you really want to know, what I'm reading right now on my mini iPad, the book is called War with Russia, written by the former Deputy, Security, uh, Deputy Supreme Allied Commander Richard Sheriff. And it's a fictionalized account uh, starting in May 2017 of War with Russia. That's what's on my table. What struck you about it? What uh, struck me about it is that it's fiction, but it's fiction that's based on an intimate understanding of facts on the ground. I mean, he was deputy supreme allied commander, and he knows what he's talking about. Uh, and he starts the book with recent history, uh, based also on what happened in Crimea and the support for the separatists in the Ukraine. So it really struck me how he managed to fuse fiction and fact together in a very compelling way. If you were not sitting here with me, who would you like to have a beer with out of the whole of history, living or dead? Wow. Well, I'm torn to between uh, having a beer with someone I admire and sitting down and having a beer with someone I intensely dislike. <laughs> um, you know, uh, being a strange person, I might actually opt for the second. Uh, I would love, in a way, to sit down and have a beer with someone as twisted as Stalin. Uh, or someone also uh, like Mao Zedong, uh, or someone like Lenin. That's the writer's attitude. They want to see the, what's behind the mask. Ambassador Anthony Gardner. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.